Hello, world. Hey, I'm excited about this book. Yeah. Yep. So live people will hear this. This won't be in the actual episode, but um, I mentioned that I was finishing a book for a bookworm in my mastermind group. Yep. And uh guy asked me, well, what book are you reading? I'm like Liminal Thinking by Dave Gray. He's like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like literally that's the reaction I got. <laughs> He's like, I can't wait for that one. <laughs> well, here's hoping it lives up to the hype. <laughs> <laughs> here's hoping. Oh, too yep. fun. Hi, Blake. Welcome. Oh, yeah, I got to go to our our page to see the chat. You do. <clears throat> and everybody who's here needs to hit the like button before we start, too, because it helps people find us. I feel like smash that those... bell. Smash the buttons. Oh, my Hashtag belt. YouTuber, right? Totally. Am I doing it right? Totally. I don't know. Like Maybe. and subscribe. <laughs> hit the bell. It's all about the bell. <laughs> you can't get the bell unless you subscribe. So you have to hit the bell. <laughs> like only winners hit bells. Ah, uh, okay. All. Only bell hitters are winners. I don't know what, how that works. <laughs> John, you're amazing. You've made us true YouTubers. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I don't think I'm a real good fit for YouTube. I'm not either. And yet here we are. Because I see my kids are, are they they like YouTube a lot, and uh, one of their favorite. YouTube people is Dude Perfect, and ah. they've been watching them for a very long time. I don't even know what they're at, but like, not from the very beginning, but pretty close. Back when they were still doing their trick shots, and they turned into the loud, obnoxious YouTube sensations that they are now. Yep. And uh, they love that kind of stuff. <clears throat> I'm just yeah. like, this is annoying. <laughs> like, if this is what YouTube is, it's not my place. <laughs> not made for youtube i appreciate Even how ridiculous is that way <laughs> yeah they've kind of gotten that way as well there's um oh what's the tech uh guy dave 2d i think who like super low-key tech guy like he mm -hmm. I, I think like i am more boisterous than him which is saying something because i am far <laughs> from a boisterous person for youtube and like, he's just steady eddie he just kind of stays with it and has done really well doing that so super kind of quiet guy and yet somehow has a huge following that's kind of my take on it nice not gonna argue with him um um i had a thought i just lost it now bye bye thought this is the danger of actually listening. <laughs> <laughs> How's that going for you? Maybe that's why people <laughs> are always thinking about what they're going to say before they get to it. Because if they don't, they'll forget it like I just did. <laughs> oh, well. This is, this is why I do bookworm with this sitting right here. <laughs> because I try to pay attention to everything you're saying, especially lately now that we've been talking about this. And yeah. I will have a thought, and I always forget what it is. I always do. <laughs> All right, I got my mind node file. I got my notes. I think I'm good. Do you want to make a podcast? See if we remember how. Oh, did I show you this? We don't need to talk about this on the podcast. But always be hustling. Totally. This is Which way I gotta go? the... Uh, oh, that's the completed... A 2048. Oh, come on, Cascable. Your focus okay, let me is... See if... I know. I don't. I have autofocus turned off. Let me pull up my Cascable app and see if I can get it to focus on this real quick. Come on. There we go. Why do you turn your autofocus off? That looks sharp, Because though. then it doesn't jump when I like lean back in my chair. But yeah, this is the 2048. I like it. Um, extended. The mod of... It's basically... A... A mod, uh, updated Apple Extended 2 feel, and it's awesome. The profile on this is... Which one is pretty, it? Is it the... Great. It's not a cherry this profile. Is, no, this is... Dang it. This is all backwards in my brain. <laughs> Come on. There we go. So there's quite a bit of a curve there. Yep. You can see that. There we go. 
This is uh, MT3, I want to okay. say. Okay, that was going to be my guess. Yeah. And I love it. It is, it is awesome. I'm plugging it back in now so I can actually use it. Now your focus is off. Yep. There we go. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't leave autofocus on just so because when you lean back, then it would stay in focus. I don't want it jumping around when I do that sort of stuff. It's fair. It's fair. Anyway. Also, I shared a picture. Um, I can show it here. I, I shared it with David Sparks this morning uh, about my desk. Also, uh, before you get too far, John wants to know if it's a Keychron, and Blake wants to know if there's going to be details in the show notes. Keychron K6, and um, probably not details in the show notes. I'm not sure. I can share the the keycaps if people are interested in them right now, there's but I don't think you can them. buy them anymore. So there's one, what's that? There's one major flaw with them. Have you found the 2048s? it? Mm -hmm. The Keychrons? Mm -hmm. No, not the Keychrons, but the 2048s, the keycaps. I don't know. I love them. <laughs> the colored, uh, the colored modifiers, the LEDs shine through. Yeah, kind of weird. That's pretty cool. But there's a major flaw with it. What's the major flaw? The letters are in the wrong spots. Oh, you and your Dvorak. Well, <laughs> not. You could actually buy the the. What do they call it? The, there's like a modified version, like coal pack or something like yeah, that. Coal which rack, is, I think is what they call it, yeah. Yeah, for Dvorak or the other weird one that people use. There's coal mac, Dvorak, and then there's, I forget, there's a third one that it fits in. Yes. Keyboard freak you. No, I'm just up with the times. <laughs> <laughs> so there's my desk, and um, it's, it's a, uh, got a lot of stuff on it whoa dude the reason that there's a lot of stuff on it is i have it set up so that i can come down and just turn stuff on and record video bookworm yep record video for product record audio for podcast or even i have a second boom with the sure 87a over oh right here. right 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 but I can even come down with Rachel and record Intentional Family sure. without moving anything hardware-wise. Did you turn your desk? I did. That well, just occurred to ago. me. That just, <laughs> so like, it just, says, just occurred to me. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure anyone would notice this. <laughs> Let me pull up the picture here so I can confirm what what is being asked here. <laughs> Cause I'm, I'm, is I'm... that a sword? Yes, that is a sword. <laughs> <laughs> There's a story behind the sword. Um, the men's ministry that we are, uh, that our church is connected with, is called Christian Men's Network, and they have this big thing every year. People all over the world will come to this conference that they do, and they, if you go through all the curriculum, they have this big commissioning ceremony. Yep. And part of the ceremony is you get a sword and it is a symbol basically that like you've gone through the curriculum and it's all based off of first Timothy two, two that like now you you've entrusted this to faithful men who will teach others. And so that's kind of how the, the ministry grows. And yeah, that's, that's a sword that I got from that commissioning ceremony. It's got a little plaque on it. It says I'm a commissioned minister to men, you know, with the date on it and stuff like that. It's not actually sharp. Uh, I don't have to slay any dragons with it. It's not a sword. Been getting into Skyrim again on the <laughs> Xbox Series. Nice. S, though, speaking nice. of slaying dragons. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Pretty slick. Right. I think there's a lot here. Make like, there's a lot to take in with this. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's quite a bit. All jammed in. But everything is exactly where I want it. Sure. <laughs> I know exactly where it all is. And I can come down here and I can create like that. <laughs> Even if my family gets home from swimming lessons right before I record. <laughs> John, you know somebody else that uses Dvorak? There's also a fairly popular person in the podcasting world that uses Dvorak. 
people probably I don't I don't know if people realize this or not though. Do you know who I'm talking about? It's He's, not gray, is it? It is gray. CGP gray really? uses Dvorak. I'm I'm ninety five percent certain. Interesting. Yep. Great fun. Dvorak's the way to go. Just gotta say that. And yet, mm. I'm in the middle of we're gonna start doing typing lessons for our kids this fall, or at least my yeah. oldest. It's time for her to get started in on that, and she's not learning Dvorak. I'm I'm not that <laughs> sold on it. She needs to learn QWERTY first, because like even in my case, like I can still type on QWERTY and do. Mm -hmm. John Dvorak uses Dvorak. Um, I still use <laughs> QWERTY on my phone primarily, so that's the main keyboard of use there. So yes, I still use that. I have to. I work in IT. I have to type on QWERTY a lot. And yet, <laughs> for whatever reason, I've done it long enough, my brain just switches back and forth. It's weird. You're a hybrid. I'm strange. All right, we should record a podcast. Welcome, Josh. We should record a podcast. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Anything I need before we start? I don't think so. I think I'm good. Oh, I have to actually create the project. On my mix pre. All right. I think I'm good. You good? I think so. I have no idea what I'm using for a start off, but we'll figure it out whenever we start. Talk about Obsidian Mobile. Wait, why? Because it came out on Monday. Okay. I can talk about that because I have <laughs> thoughts on that. Okay. We can do that. All right. Tell me when to start. All right. Three, two, one. There's this really cool new app that came out on the App Store this week, Mike. Oh, yeah? What's that? It's Obsidian for mobile. I need to get my <laughs> bell out now so we can start hitting the bell for Obsidian every single time it comes out. Uh, Blake's got the emoji in the chat for you. There you go. Nailed it, Blake. So you've been on the Insider build for quite a while, right? So you've been using Obsidian on mobile for a while, right? Is that true? I have, yep. Okay. Yep. What are your thoughts on it? It's pretty solid. It's kind of amazing that they took essentially all of Obsidian and smashed it into an iOS app. <laughs> sure. It's not exactly the same, obviously, uh, but one of the genius things that I thought they did was on an iPhone, you can swipe down from anywhere but the top of the screen, which triggers either Control Center or your notifications. And that triggers the Command Palette, which is the exact same gesture that opens up Spotlight inside of or in iOS on your home screen, which in a video for the upcoming course that I'm working on at the Suite Setup, I actually described the command palette as sort of spotlight for Obsidian. <laughs> so nice. that just instantly fit. Good it's work. got this cool little mobile toolbar above the keyboard for like quick actions and things. It really does a pretty good job of taking advantage of some some of the the interface differences and in using them in a a positive way, but it still gives you access to the core and community plugins, all the sync, all all the stuff that's there on the desktop, you know, is is there on mobile. It's a pretty impressive launch. Uh, I don't typically look at the ratings for these apps when they get released, but this one I was curious <laughs> because Obsidian is an Electron app, and I'm sure it's not like pure iOS development that's going into this iOS app either. So I was kind of wondering how all of the true iOS productivity nerds were going to rate an Electron app on the App Store. But as of today, when I looked, it's got a solid 5.0 rating, which I think it, it actually deserves. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's solid. I, I know like Federico Vitici is using Obsidian primarily on an iOS device. And I think at this point, I would recommend even mere mortals like you and me, uh, that that is totally doable with this application. Hmm. Okay. Fine. So let me just say that the sync on my side was uh, painful <laughs> to get set up. <laughs> so the way to set up sync with the iOS version is to open up the iOS app, create an Obsidian vault, store it in iCloud, which will then create an Obsidian folder in your iCloud drive. Okay. 
and then a separate subfolder for the vault that you you just set up. So if you name your vault notes, it's going to be iCloud Drive slash Obsidian slash notes. Then what you do is you take all of your stuff. If you're going to migrate it from the Mac, you're going to, you dump it all in that iCloud Drive folder, and then you let iCloud Drive be the sync. You don't actually use the Obsidian sync service. I agree. I got some wonkiness when I was beaming stuff up and beaming stuff down. There are advantages to doing it that way. You get a year of revision history, and it's all end-to-end -end encrypted. So there's people who that's the right solution for, but everybody right. else, right. save yourself the four slash eight bucks a month and just put it in an iCloud Drive folder. And if you put it in a Git repository, this is going to be completely painful for you. Just going to say that. Because <laughs> Back up to Git. Don't sync from Git. <laughs> yeah, it 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 forces you into that. So you end up with a scenario where, like, for example, I had my notes in an iCloud folder, but that doesn't work. Like, I couldn't just reuse that and open it in Obsidian because it has to be in its little sandboxed Correct. area. It's got to be in the Obsidian folder. Yep. Correct. So you have to move it there if you want to use that. You can create a local. Not sure why you would do that when everybody wants sync and such. So, like, I had to do, like, moving my Git repo on my Mac and then... Yes, basically reconfigure almost all of it to get it to continue working, which I wasn't expecting. In my head, I was like, oh, well, let me just open a vault. I've already got the notes and working copy. Let's see if it will actually let me use the file system on the phone. And the answer was no. You couldn't do that. So you got to start all over. <laughs> so just be aware of that. If you're going to yep. use it, that's a thing. Uh, outside of that, I haven't used it a ton, but I have used it uh, a little bit. And can't really say what I would use it for outside of a potential inbox inside like on my phone but drafts serves that purpose so I haven't really figured out why I'm using it on my phone yet <laughs> so I'm glad I didn't pay the extra just to be on the insider to get it ahead of time because I'm not sure I'm going to use it <laughs> but it's sure. there it's kind of cool I'm glad that they were able to get it out because I know that it has, because it, of it being an Electron app, there's a ton that it is able to do from day one, and they don't really have to rewrite much at all to make it work, so there's yeah. that. Yeah, and also if you uh, use the iCloud Drive Sync over the the Obsidian Sync service and you keep it in that iCloud Drive folder, it opens itself up to a lot of shortcut automation through the Files app. Uh, I actually use drafts to capture things. And so if you're just going to use Obsidian to capture stuff, you know, there are better options. But if you want a note-taking app kind of with the intended purpose of using it for creation, I think it's it's the best option out there at the moment. Yeah, it's fair. I mean, I'm I'm doing a lot of my stuff through drafts and such into working copy, which then syncs via Git, and then it shows up that way mm -hmm. with the automatic stuff so i do a lot of that which is fine but it's just an edge case and an edge scenario that's not typical for people so just be aware of that sure. if you're one of these weird nut jobs like me that's a thing you got to be aware of just saying mm. <laughs> <laughs> fun times all right so should we do some follow-up let's do it you want me to go first? Sure, why not? All right. I didn't do these. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of did them. Uh, the pop tag and OmniFocus, I did not do, but I don't think I looked at OmniFocus this week. So, fail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have been on this kick lately about distancing myself from my plan as much as possible because I think it's good for me to learn to go with the flow a little bit more. <laughs> That's the short version. Uh, I still time block my days, but there have been a couple days where I kind of knew I had a more chill day and I had to fight the urge to just do it. And I'm trying to force myself to be more present 
in the moment and ask myself as I'm going, like, what's the best thing to be doing right now? As long as I have a plan, I just default back to the plan. Okay. And that's great from a work context because all my work stuff ends up there, but it kind of gets in the way with some of the personal stuff. I'm trying to figure out what that balance really looks like. I recognize that like one of the things I talk about being able to work from home, my kids are home. I can open the door. I can take a break. We can go play basketball, you know, and I found myself not really taking those, taking advantage of those opportunities as much as I would have liked to. I would go days without doing it. And I was like, well, why is that? It's because I, I always have this plan that is telling me exactly what I need to be doing. And unless I get done early, it's hard for my brain to like let go and feel free to take a break. So I'm trying to retrain it a little bit and force myself to be like, what do you feel like doing right now? <laughs> go play basketball? Okay, fine. Let's go play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm not, you know, ditching time blocking, task management. I'm still kind of like jotting down the things that I want to be doing. My plan for today just simply has a bunch of Obsidian videos that I would like to record. And uh, I've recorded a couple of them already. When I get done with this, I'm giving myself permission to be like, ah, I don't really feel like recording the other ones. Or if I you know, want to crank out a few more, then I, I can do that. So pop tag and OmniFocus is a fail. Identify tasks to delegate. I don't have a big list of these, but I have delegated tasks. So <laughs> this is uh, kind of win. Good work. Uh, Good work. I have an assistant now, which is great. And the uh, one of the things that I am terrible at doing is remembering to go post on my own personal site about the podcast that I publish. I have no problem publishing Bookworm on time. I have no problem publishing Intentional Family on time. I have no problem publishing Focus, but all of those live on different servers. There's different processes associated with all of those. And then I never go back to my own site and write a summary post and be like, hey, you know, in this episode, Joe and I covered this book. And so I now have delegated the process for all three of those podcasts to an assistant who is doing a great job pre preparing the posts. And then I just go in and publish them within 24 hours after, uh, after she creates them. And I've been doing that just so I can make sure that she doesn't have any questions and she understands the, the process, but she's doing an awesome job. So I'm ready now to just let her hit publish on her own. Which sounds like a stupid little thing, but what I've realized with this, because these these posts literally take like five, maybe ten minutes at the at tops to create on my site, but it's the kind of thing where it's like, oh, I know I should do that at some point, and then I don't do it because I'm doing something else, but it's in the back of my mind, and it causes me to always go back and think about that, and so I can't. The thing that I'm doing takes longer, so the actual cost for me not doing these is probably many, many hours <laughs> if you <laughs> add it all up. And I've delegated now, I don't have to think about it. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I've also delegated some podcast editing. Uh, Intentional Family is now being edited by my son who did a phenomenal job. I showed him kind of my approach to editing. He's using Ferrite on the iPad. And then I'm like, okay, now you try this one, you know, and he's editing it on a Saturday and I'm there with him so I can answer any questions that he has. And like, how would you handle this one? You know, I showed him like the first five minutes. He did the rest of the episode and then he gave it to me to, to spot check. I made three additional edits. <laughs> he got on so quick. Go Toby. He's probably better at it than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I don't have Kids. to edit intentional family anymore, um, which is which is pretty cool. And then the last one, identifying tasks to batch. This I did not, I did not do. I probably should still do this. Uh, just figure out like what are all my admin tasks, kind of like a shutdown routine sort of a thing, which I think that's what this is going to morph into for me. I've been thinking about that is redefining my morning and evening routines. Uh, and I think a shutdown routine would be a, a logical addition to that. But just identifying a bunch of things that I can batch do whenever I have time doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Good work. I have to admit that the pop tag and OmniFocus sounded like a hokey thing to me from the beginning. <laughs> I've I've seen folks that do like the procrastinate tag in OmniFocus. I don't think I've ever done that, but it 
I don't know. I've I've never seen anybody pull it off successfully. It's it's a fun concept, well, but I don't know that I've ever seen it effective. So here's here's what I'm really after, and the pop tag really isn't probably the way to do this. But like, I want something to show up in a certain perspective. It's like, hey, you chose not to do this before, and that's tally number one. And now you're choosing not to do it again. That's tally number two. And by the time you choose not to do it a third time, it should just automatically be deleted. Like if I, I was creating my own application, that's what would happen here. Sure. It's like stuff keeps popping up, not even in a review context, because I know review is like a really killer feature for OmniFocus. And that's not really what I'm talking about, because you could review a project every week and you're going to review it a bunch of different times. But I want this like exploding thing, which is going to keep track of you keep putting this off. Now you have to stop doing it because you're never going to do it. Let's be real here. <laughs> Sounds like you need a set of scripts for it. Potentially. I'm a little bit nervous automating that, but that's <laughs> kind of the thought process. <laughs> and so with the well, original pop tag, it was going to be, okay, you're looking at this once pop, you know, sub tag one. And then next time you just change the sub tag pop, two you know and then by the time you get to pop three you know now you have everything pop three you can go look at those and be like okay these are the ones that you need to just batch delete because you're never going to do them or it auto deletes it could but that's the part that's scary <laughs> to me until i do it manually first i don't want to automate it well if you automated it puts a little fire under it <laughs> <laughs> that is also true <laughs> anyway that said uh I had one task from last episode, which was to create some templates for video projects, which I did do, and that has proved extremely helpful and have used those a few times already. So kudos to templates. I feel one, like one of the interesting things with that is that it seems like that makes it easier to start a video if that's a thing, mm -hmm. like because yeah. the template is there it feels like there's less time involved to do that, thus it's easier to do. So that would be an encouragement to anybody who has projects like that. Build a template. It helps. Yeah, templates are the unsung hero of automation, in yes. my opinion. Yes, Because they're the kind of thing that anybody can use, even if you don't think you are an automation person. When most people think of automation, they think of writing those custom scripts that you were just talking about for OmniFocus. Yes. And that's, I don't even know how to do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so that can be intimidating when you think about automation. It's like, well, I guess automation is just not for me. But then you get into stuff like basic shortcuts, you know, and that still feels like, well, there's really some advanced stuff you can do with this. Maybe this isn't for me. And then you get even lower level like templates. And it's like, yes, these I totally can wrap my brain around and I can leverage these right now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right, let's step into today's book because I feel like there's a lot of things we could talk about. This is probably going to go long. My apologies. We'll get there. But this is one that I have had recommended at least by two different people in multiple cases. And I'm kind of glad it's been recommended because this is going to be a fun conversation here. But this is Liminal Thinking by Dave Gray. And I think every person that has seen this sitting on my desk or seen me carrying it somewhere, which that generally happens in some form, like, wait, what? What is liminal thinking? It's like, Okay, that's that's one response. The other response is, "Oh, you have to let me know what you think of it." Like that's the other response. Like it just is <laughs> yeah. kind of one of those two is is where people tend to land. But this is so the subtitle on this is "Create the Change You Want by Changing the Way You Think," and I think that's an apt subtitle for this. And I I'm kind of excited about this one. I I think this is along the lines of the Shane Parrish book that we read. I'm drawing a blank yes. on the title. What I usually don't the great remember. Great Mental Models. There you go. I had the same thought. Yep. 
I, I don't normally remember the author's name and not the title. I usually remember it the other way around. But, um, but yeah, great mental models. It, it kind of hits that same nerve with me. And I, I don't know that it has the same – it doesn't have the same layout per se. No. But it, it does have that feel at least. What were your gut reactions on it, Mike? Yeah, so The Great Mental Models talks about this is a lattice work of frameworks that you can use. And this has a lot of the same sort of ideas, except it's packaged more so in a system. And I have thoughts on that, but <laughs> maybe let's get into the content sure. first. I, I, I'm still undecided if this way is better or worse. I think I know which one I prefer, but I also want to talk through this because more than once you've been able to change my mind about things. <laughs> so is that a belief you're holding on to at the moment? Uh, yes. So the ideas <laughs> in here, I really like. The system, I'm a little bit skeptical about. Okay. I will tell you that. So there's two parts. Here, part one, how beliefs shape everything, where there's principles, and then part two, what do you do about it, where there are practices. I'm not quite sure how to implement those practices consistently. I know he's got like a whole big process, and there's action items at the end of every single one of these chapters, and I did not go through and finish every one of those action items. There's a couple that I jotted down as like, these are cool, I'm going to do these, but I don't really want to just follow the system that he kind of is outlining here. And to be fair, he's not saying this is a system, you got to do it this way, but he is trying to lead you down a path and it feels very linear. Whereas the great mental models does not, it's here's all of these ideas and you can combine them any way you want. Yeah, I think that's fair. Let's, let's start with, so in the introduction, he starts with what is liminal thinking, which is the question I got a lot, because if you were to just sit and have someone define the term liminal thinking, most people aren't going to have an answer, I don't think. At least the folks that I ran into didn't have any clue. So liminal thinking, uh, the word liminal comes from the Latin root, l I think it's limon? Lemon? I assume it's limon. Limon? Anyway, means threshold. So it's the point where you're crossing over from one thing into the other. It's like that boundary between things. So if you start mm -hmm. to combine that, it's the boundary between thinking of one thing into thinking another thing. So it's the boundary between those two thoughts. And on the surface, that seems like a very minor thing. Okay, cool. Fun thoughts. <laughs> you can have a thought that's between two thoughts and it's called a liminal thought or liminal thinking in that time or in that, that space. But he takes it one step further in that, it, it, to use his argument here, change happens at the boundaries of things, which makes sense when you start processing that. So if liminal thinking is the boundary between two thoughts and change happens within boundaries, change is able to happen with liminal thinking. You with me? And yep. that is the area that we're going to process and that he discusses in this book. And it's really an interesting way to term it, I think. I, I can't say that I have any argument against this concept of change happening within the boundaries because whenever I think about all of the change that's happened in society over the years, almost every time... Well, actually, I've never been able to find a thing where change happened without a boundary of some kind, whether it's intellectual or physical. I haven't been able to nail down what that would be, but I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about that particular thought. Anyway, change happens in the boundaries. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say about this introductory part. I remember the, the threshold definition and then basically forgot about it until the end of the book when yeah. he brought it back. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how it fits to, to the visual that he's building throughout the first section here necessarily. 
he basically is talking about how we define reality and what are you going to do with that threshold definition when you look at that pyramid type diagram for example like it it's cool you can jot it down but so what <laughs> it is a cool diagram i think we'll get to that I don't, does he start that in the next in the first part i don't remember might be part or principle number two so sure okay we yeah. have 15 different chapters to get through <laughs> yeah yeah so let's let's start with part one how beliefs shape everything and he's going to within the very beginning of this part he kind of lays out that beliefs are the foundation that things stand on and that is the foundation that so many things that we think are founded on and he has this diagram that we'll try to explain here in a little bit but that he's trying to dismantle that if you will and just show us that our beliefs are a very small construct within the broader scheme of reality, if you will. Now, that might sound kind of philosophical, but I think it makes sense as we, we go through this. And principle one, where he's starting to lay this foundation, uh, is that beliefs are models. And it. I'll just say this. At the beginning of each chapter, he has like this little sentence that kind of summarizes the whole chapter, which is helpful because you can kind of get an idea of what you're about to go through. Uh, is it the beginning or is it the end? I just realized it's at the end. Never mind. He summarizes it at the end. Never mind. I was reading it backwards. But on principle one, he has this statement at the end. Beliefs seem like perfect representations of the world, but in fact, they are imperfect models for navigating a complex, multidimensional, unknowable reality. Which, yep, unknowable reality is like, wait, what? <laughs> So, yep. anyway, beliefs are models. He starts with the story of the blind men trying to describe an elephant, and they've all got an individual part, and that's the reality that they know. So when they describe an elephant, one of them's describing an ear, one of them's describing the tail, one of them's describing the trunk, and that is their reality. And he says, we can grasp individual fragments, but we'll never be able to grasp the entire thing. He also says on page six that a belief is something you hold in your mind, a kind of map or model of that external reality. Sounds a whole lot like the map is not the territory. Exactly, Blake. <laughs> the difference here is that uh, he adds one additional detail that you mentioned, Joe, that you're never going to be able to fully understand the territory. So yes, the map is the territory but even the map maker making their opinionated interpretation of what is important is not able to know the entirety of the territory that they are trying to summarize, which is a minor detail, but I think it's important. The map is not the territory is a quote by Alfred Korzyb Korzybski, because that's on the page right at the end of this. <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. That is right in the midst of all this, because that is the transition from principle one to two, because principle two is beliefs are created. This is where we get the pyramid that he uses. I don't, it's not through the rest of the book, but he uses it sporadically through the whole thing. And yep. beliefs are created. And here's, here's essentially what he's getting to. I'm going to do my best to explain this pyramid through explaining this principle i think that's how it's going to work uh basically your foundation that everything is built on is reality quote unquote uh which he has in parentheses the unknowable and on top of that is your experience which is a big long block that things are built on but the problem is that you have your attention focused on some small subset of your life experience which means you can imagine that as kind of a pole that sticks up one really small stick that sticks up from that experience like on, a needle on a record player exactly exactly super tiny on top of that needle somehow balanced up there are your theories and on top of that are your are your judgments and then on top of that are your beliefs 
So if you start to process all of this, you have the reality, which is the unknowable, your experience, which you have your attention focused on one small piece of that to create the stick on which your theories, your judgments, and thus your beliefs are all teeter-tottering up there. And then above that, the beliefs on which you stand is what you think of as the obvious. You and the other people in your bubble of belief. Correct. Yes. <laughs> and when you start to like, just think through all of these little tiny details with this, I really, really like this diagram because yep. it just clicks, at least for me, because there's so much that we have considered our foundation, our core, how could anyone not believe this? And yet, if you follow this model, all of that is founded on judgments, which are founded on theories, which are focused on this stick of attention, which could easily be tipped over mm -hmm. if you don't try to prop it up with all of your <laughs> ignoring of other facts and such. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot, I think, in this particular diagram. I'm a fan. On the topic of that record needle attention, by the way, he shares some stats that our capacity for perceiving information is about 11 million bits per second. But your conscious attention, your focus, is limited to 40 bits per second. So already you're limited in your capacity for receiving the information, but the stuff that you are really understanding is severely limited. Yes. <laughs> so that's a very effective model for the point that he's making that you can't know everything because you are limited by the amount of information that you can take in. Uh, I want to point out here, Josh mentions that this book was published before the Great Mental Models. And I think it's interesting. This chapter really spoke to me because I understood the map is not the territory from the Great Mental Models. And I was thinking about this. The way he describes the map is not the territory is not very good, in my opinion. Uh, if I would have just read that first chapter before getting to this chapter two without the context of reading the great mental models, I feel like this would have been received very differently by me. So I don't really know what to do with that other than to call it out like, the Great Mental Models does a really great job of ex of explaining the role of the cartographer in selecting the things that are important. But he's got a different kind of spin on it, and I think it's less effective, which is just that, yeah, you're never going to know everything. <laughs> which I don't really understand, given the definition of liminal, because that threshold definition, really, what's the point of that except to understand where your limits are and then choose to step beyond those. I think that's what he's trying to teach us to do through all of the action items that are associated with this particular book. But I feel like had I not read the great mental models before this one, I would be much less motivated to do so. It would be very much more like pie in the sky. Let's just think about this instead of let's actually do this. Sure. What, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense because the fact that both of us had independent connections to the great mental models coming into this one, it, it's an indicator, I think, that it's one of those, as Mortimer Adler would say, is interconnected or there's a term. I'm drawing a blank on it. There's a term he used for it where you're starting to put the book in perspective amongst all the other books. I think it's in topical reading, but I there don't know go. the exact term for the kind of like that. that you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So because they're within the same topic, you can't help but put one within the view with the lens of the other uh, as a result. So in this case, I don't think that's a bad thing. It's just a thing to be aware of. We have that bias because we have read the great mental models coming into this one. But in this particular yep. principle, it's I think the, the point that he's trying to make here is that the beliefs that we hold that we stand on are created based on where we focus our attention. Yep. Which is kind of okay. alarming when you stop and wonder about it <laughs> for more than 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs>
if that's all it takes to completely change somebody's beliefs, it's at least something that you should keep in mind, I would say, which I think would bring us to principle three. And I know I'm kind of moving quickly through this and we're probably going to continue doing that just because there's a lot to cover. <laughs> there's a lot here. Yeah, There is a lot. I thought about trying to figure out how to cut some of this out, but I just don't think it makes sense unless you touch on each one, at least briefly. Uh, so anyway, principle three, beliefs create a shared world. And it, this particular one is, is, I mean, think about like, okay, you have this belief that you have created because of where you've chosen to focus your attention. But whenever you create those beliefs, you're going to have the tendency to want to find other people who have that same belief. And you're mm -hmm. creating a world based on those underlying beliefs that you can share with other people who also have that belief. If that makes sense. That was maybe kind of a roundabout way to say that. But basically, you're finding people who are like you. And you're building kind of your personal world based on those belief systems. Yes, although he really gets into that, in my opinion, in principle five with the bubble of belief. Um, there is an aspect of this, though, too, because it's in the title, Beliefs Create a, yeah. a Shared World. He talks about the learning loop here, and that is that your needs influence your beliefs, influence your actions, influence your results, and then that provides feedback. And then that can either be positive or negative. He defines them as a doom loop or a delight loop, and he tells the story about the rescue dog that they, they had who bit one of their kids, and then they had an option to respond and trigger a, a doom loop, or they brought in the dog whisperer and changed it into a delight loop. I think that story is cool. When I read that, I was like, if a, if my dog bit somebody, I'm not hiring the dog whisperer to try to rehab the dog. <laughs> rehab the dog. I love that. Although <laughs> my my uh, emotional response is maybe a little bit raw. I actually got bit by a dog a couple of weeks ago. I was biking on a trail. Okay. And... Someone had their dogs off of the leash on the right side of the trail. I saw the one dog, and I have a bell on my bike, so I ding the bell, you know, let, let them know, coming through on the left, go way over to the left side, so there's plenty of space between me and the, the owner. Right. And right. I see the, the one dog off of the leash, you know, hears me ding the bell and kind of cowers over by the owner, and then so I'm going around him, and then, on the right side of this trail is a bunch of brush and all of a sudden like a bat out of hell comes this other dog just booking it right towards me i go down into this like little culvert ravine sort of a thing and i'm just thinking like there's no way this this dog is gonna gonna get me it's got to like move to intercept like a free safety in football and it's got to be perfect because <laughs> i am booking it on my bike but he totally nailed me he bit me in the ankle <laughs> <laughs> so I'm bleeding. I stop. I look at it, and the guy's like, "Sorry about that," and he takes off. <laughs> Good job. Way to be a responsible dog owner. Yeah, yeah. So people, I don't know. Maybe that is influencing my perspective when I read this. Is like, <laughs> okay, good job for you. I'm. That's not how I would have reacted at all. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that dog yep. is out of here. <laughs> yeah, I I've been around a lot of. We used to, my wife and I used to volunteer at a dog shelter where the dogs that people didn't want or who had bitten someone, that's where they went. And we got to be the ones who fed them and took them out for walks and all the things and all sorts of rough animals who have been through a lot. And it's amazing how, like, if you have the right demeanor, you can work with these dogs and do a good job, but... Some of them take a lot of very detailed care to be able to to work with. So dogs that just randomly run up and bite people and then run off just seems strange to me. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a very deep bite. I still do have a little bit of a, a scar on my ankle. It happened two weeks ago, but it wasn't deep enough where like felt like I needed to go in yeah um the guy took off so i couldn't you know make sure that it was 
registered, had it shots, whatever. I mean, it looked like it had one of those harnesses on. Guy just had unhooked it, you know. So, okay, I don't know, whatever. Okay, but the big thing is like, if I, for me, it's a dog, right? <laughs> yes. And I'm not going if my kids are doing something. Uh, which is triggering something in the dog and causing the dog to react. Like I'm going to tell my kids not to do that, but also I'm going to get the dog out of that situation because yeah. I cannot control my kids hundred percent. They're not going to be perfect little angels all the time. And my kids are not going to get bit by a dog. Like that's, I'm not going to allow that in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so he's talking like his kid got bit by a dog. And I'm just like, what is wrong with you? Get rid of that dog. <laughs> <laughs> Your kid is more important. But that's just my perspective. I understand sure, like, sure. different people. But I had trouble relating to him at that point. At, the, at, at this point in the book, he could not have chosen a worse example to keep me engaged. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to... Okay, this this will be a good example because this is what he's talking about, how your beliefs inform how you perceive something. I know, but he's also trying to inspire me to change, right? I know, point, I know, like, nah, but let me tell nah. you how it came across to me because mine is very different than what you took it as because whenever he says that he had the dog whisperer come in, you took it as he's immediately trying to figure out how to train the dog not to do that again, right? Is that fair to say? Like you're thinking he's assuming he's going to keep the dog and try to rehab the dog. And I took it as... He brought this guy in to find out if it's something he should have, like it should the dog be put down. Like I took it as he yeah, wasn't sure yeah. he was able to make the right call on that. So he brought in somebody who could and they're telling him, no, actually you can work with this dog very easily to help him. And that's how I took yep. it. It's like he was just seeking a second opinion there, but I don't no, think he I, actually I calls out which way he was intending it. Cause he doesn't say that part. Yeah, he does say that he had that thought, like, oh, we got to put the dog down. And I'm not right. saying you have to put the dog down, but the dog at least cannot live in my house anymore. And uh, Josh brings up, depends if the kid instigated it. I disagree with that. I mean, I have a three-year-old. She's going to instigate a lot of stuff with our golden doodle. But the very first thing that we did when we got it is I started messing with this thing. It, whenever, it, whenever it eats, I'm poking it in the mouth. I'm pulling on its tail. I'm going in between <laughs> its paws. I'm doing everything I can to annoy this dog. <laughs> And then when it responds even a little bit aggressively and like, no, you know, you, you don't let it do that. And sure. it's learned over a couple of months, you know, it wasn't even that long. And now my kids are so rough with this dog and it does not even care. Like you can totally train this into a dog. And if you are going to bring a dog into your home and you have a family, I feel like this is your responsibility. Like, yeah. Yes. You do have to make sure the dog is, is not going to react and, and, and bite a kid. But, at the same time, you don't know where the dog is coming from when you get a rescue dog. So these two things, my personal opinion, don't don't mesh very well. Yeah, <laughs> it's not something I would be willing yep. to do. But anyway, different strokes, different folks, dogs, kids, shared worlds, great fun, right? So, <laughs> yeah. all right, let's let's keep going because the next one's kind of fun too. Principle four: beliefs create blind spots. I like this one. This one's very interesting because what generally happens is if you hold a belief, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to see outside of it. And there there are a few, I have, I have all sorts of things where this comes up, but one of the stories he tells is that he had a friend tell him that he was unable to get a job as a, was it an associate professor at uh, a college because he didn't have a master's degree? a teacher of some yeah. sort because he didn't have a master's degree. And he figured he could either go through the work, get a master's degree so that he could apply to the job or he could just apply to the job and find out if he actually needed a <laughs> master's degree. So he opted to apply for the job without the master's degree and got the job without the master's degree. <laughs> so yeah, like because this other person and I've, heard this many times like you can't get certain jobs because you don't have x y and z credentials and people say that fairly regularly but it's odd the number of times those exceptions are made uh one that i know that i had to work through just here recently was uh whenever i was in the process of trying to buy our now new house new old house definitely not new uh <laughs> 
whenever we were house. It's, it's <laughs> over 100 years old so it's definitely not new the the thing is that it they were telling us at least the mortgage company was telling us we couldn't close on the house within a certain amount of time because it needed a new septic and they weren't going to allow us to close on it until the septic was put in okay so i don't know any different so i just kind of follow that i relay that to my agent who immediately says oh no they can close without it the septic being done. We'll just do X, Y, and Z, and then it'll be fine. And I'm sitting here like, wait, what? But they, <laughs> the guys who give us the money to be able to write the check to be able to close on the house said no, and you're telling me yes. Okay, now what? <laughs> so what do we do? Uh, long story short, we closed in 28 days. The septic still isn't installed, uh, but it's being installed very shortly because they allowed us to close without the septic being installed because of some quirks and how all the rules work and <laughs> it worked out better for everybody involved and it made it for a made it a better deal for everybody involved but that was a blind spot at least to me yep. like, i had no idea that was even an option but in front of the right person it's like oh no you can you can get an exception on that that's fine what but anyway yeah. that's that's an example of a blind spot that's what he's talking about here yeah and the name that uh, of the term that he uses for this is limiting belief, a belief that narrows the range of possibilities. And he mentions that even your closest friends may share limiting beliefs that close off opportunities for you, even though they have the best of intentions. So your mortgage company is just trying to make it simple for you to understand what the steps are and outline everything so you can move forward as quickly as possible. And then your agent is like, actually, you can do these other things and showed you some different oppor or some different uh, some different opportunities, a different path, a different way of of doing things. And that's cool that you had somebody who was thinking that way, who was able to do that for you. I think it's a little bit more difficult when you don't have someone who's telling you, hey, try <laughs> these other right, things. Right like the situation of the person who has just gotten the advice that, yeah, you need a master's degree before you can apply for this position. If there's no one else telling you otherwise, it's hard to put yourself in the position where, well, I'm just going to see what happens. But I love that idea of like everything that people tell you questioning whether that is actually true and seeing what you can get away with basically. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have to say like that whole concept, of like what we went through with getting the house closed and the time frame that we did, there were at least five different entities involved that all had to align with exceptions in order to make that happen. And every single one of them, I was the one that had to make those calls and, and get those exceptions, which is strange that I even was able to do that. Cause I don't, that is not me at all. <laughs> and going through that process just in talking to these folks almost everybody was in the the mindset that oh you need that oh okay i i mean we don't normally do that but i i suppose that's okay let me well yeah okay i'll send that letter over like almost yeah. all of them were that way and it made me yeah. like huh maybe i should just ask for random things and just see what people give <laughs> like i don't know yes, maybe that's taking yes. advantage i don't know but it's like okay uh sure why not <laughs> so the one thing i hear from people all the time whenever i talk about email and like disconnecting from your email like oh that's great for you i could never do that how do you know have you ever <laughs> tried to apply this principle to breaking free from your email i bet it would work <laughs> Yep, I hear you. I hear you. Anyway, it's it's just it's made not me as wonder. Cool as getting a job that requires a master's without the master's, correct? But yes, I mean that's that's the place to start for this kind of stuff. I think is like question all of the guiding principles that operate that govern the way that you you operate, and try to move the needle in the direction that you want it to go. <laughs> yes. Yep. And there's there's all sorts of things too. Like since going through that process, I've and we're doing a massive remodel on the house right now, so I've got a lot of stuff torn apart. But when I've had inspectors or engineers in and out, like generally a lot of people are like, oh no, you can't do this because of X, Y, and Z. I've learned at this point to just ask, like, well, what would make it possible? 
Like I don't I'm not sure. asking for an exception. I'm not asking you to do anything. I just want to know what would it take to make it possible. Yes, I cannot take X, Y, and Z. I can't take that wall out of the house. Sure. What would make it possible for me to take that wall out of the house? What has sure. to happen for that to be able to be done? Uh, and in every case so far, they're like, oh, well, you have to put this concrete thing in the basement, and then then you could put that beam in. It's like, oh, so whenever I do this, I can take that wall out if I add a pad in the basement. Yeah. So it's not impossible. <laughs> so like, you get what I'm saying? Like, just asking yep. those questions is it's strangely satisfying, honestly. <laughs> but even if they believe it's impossible, there are places where you can push and bend the rules. He tells a story later on about the guy who works at the place where you have to wear a certain uniform. I think it was a white shirt and blue, uh, blue slacks. Mm -hmm. And he just wore whatever he wanted. And he just kept doing it. And everybody yep. saw it. And they're like, this guy keeps breaking the rules. But no one did anything about it. And over time, he kept doing this. And then he also brought in a whiteboard and wrote something different on it or drew something different on it every day. And the fact that he was breaking the rule branded him as the creative guy. Yep. <laughs> it actually created more value <laughs> in the eyes of everybody else in the company who was just abiding by the rule. Yep. So if they would have went and asked somebody, is this possible? They would have said, no, it's impossible. But he just did it anyways and got not only got away with it, but essentially like got promoted in everybody's eyes because of it. <laughs> this, this is where it's just fascinating to me. Like, okay, well, people have these limiting beliefs. They may not even realize they have them, but if you yep. even hint at a question towards them, they can sometimes crumble very quickly, which yep. leads us into the next one, principle five, beliefs defend themselves. Basically, there's this concept of self-sealing logic where this is exactly what you would think it is. We have our beliefs, and we will try to find information that confirms those beliefs because it's comfortable. And if something challenges those beliefs, it's uncomfortable, and we'll tend to avoid it. And mm -hmm. if we're presented with something that is, in fact, very contradictory to what we already believe, we'll somehow spin it with some crazy, ridiculous logic, even if it contradicts some other part <laughs> of our beliefs, so that our entire structure doesn't have to fall down. So don't do that challenge your beliefs yeah <laughs> yeah a bubble of belief uh reinforce reinforces and protects existing beliefs by denying the possibility of other beliefs and he gave a couple of examples of this which again said topical reading for the win talked about nokia and apple's iphone blackberry also i think uh fits this description that's what i thought of i thought of the the innovator's dilemma yep. by and did Martin too. christensen and then the Detroit automakers versus uh, Toyota. And without that context, his brief description of these two things, I don't think hits home. But because yep. we have gone through the innovator's dilemma, it's like, oh, I totally get this. Yes. And that's the thing. I don't know how to disconnect from where I am right now as I read this book. But I do kind of question if this is like one of the first books that you pick up is it as effective as it was when you and I read it? Because it's not a very long book, and there are a lot of visuals here, and there's a lot of blanks that we have already filled in because we have read some other books prior to this. Yes, I think it is very possible that you go through this and you have very surface-level understanding of some of these things, if you understand them at all, and you walk out of this book maybe with more questions than when you went into it. Yeah, that was that was something I was trying to pay attention to this time, because we've we've mentioned that. I it occurred to me that we have mentioned that on the last few books, where we don't know if a certain part is actually that great because we have enough of this syntopical background that yep. informs us whenever we get to that. So I was trying my best to pay attention to this as I went through this one, and I have to say that whenever was on a walk through the woods and stuff last night just to try to process some of this. And one of the things I came to is like, I think this is actually a very good foundational piece to start with. 
I don't think there is the need for some other book, even the books that we didn't care for. Like how many times have we now mentioned how to read a book, which we didn't rate well and innovators dilemma, which we did not (laughs) like. And yet they continue to inform the books that we read after them. So I think that this is one that likely fits that bill of could be a good starter book with this type of thing. And you can pick the parts that are of interest to you or that are pain points for you and then find the outcropping from that. Uh, The easy way to do that is to easily just go back through the bookworm log and listen to all of them. And then you'll be able to pick out which books you should read to fill in those gaps. That's the best way that you could possibly do this. I'm just going to say that. (laughs) All right. So principle five, beliefs defend themselves. Principle. One other thing on... One other thing on this, he mentions that that there's two ways that people make sense of new ideas. They ask, is it internally coherent? So basically, does it line up with the other things that you think you know? And then is it externally valid? And I thought it was interesting that he said people rarely test ideas for external validity when they don't have internal coherence. So that means that there is a very strong possibility that something is externally valid but you never even test it because it is not internally coherent. Yes. <laughs> so that that point, I think, is kind of getting back to some of the stuff he was talking about at the very beginning about you don't know what you think you know. But this is the point where that really clicked for me. Solid. Principle six, beliefs are tied to identity. I would say that's exactly what it sounds like. You know, if you want to, (laughs) what's the quote they have here at the beginning? It's from Tom Robbins. If you want to change the world, change yourself. So whenever you have beliefs, it's very easy for us to put ourselves in a spot where our entire identity is tied to those. And it's because, like, if you have all of these judgments and theories and your attention is focused on a certain part of your experience using that pyramid once more, right? If you're doing all of that, you tend to put yourself at the top, and what you're standing on is what you see as who you are. Think about that. Whenever you talk to somebody, how many times do they refer to, like if you ask ask somebody who they are, they always talk about the things that they believe in. You ever notice that? Yeah. It's like, that's not actually who you are. Those are the things that you, being who you are, think. But that doesn't necessarily translate completely. Yeah, those are the the governing beliefs, yes. which are tied to your identity and your feelings of self worth. And he has a visual in this section of like the the tree, the inverse tree roots. You know, so you have your beliefs up at the top, and then they all come back into like the the few ideas at the bottom. Those are your governing beliefs, the ones that really define who you are. Uh, and when your governing beliefs get attacked, he says that that's like you are being attacked. I also found this part interesting where he talks about the conspiracy theories because <laughs> your governing beliefs being tied to your identity what do you do if you don't have control over your life if you feel that you are a victim and there are other people who are determining how happy, successful, satisfied you are, then that's kind of the ideal environment for these conspiracy theories to take off. He says that these thrive in in groups specifically, so not just individuals, but groups because that bubble of belief, they reinforce it, right? I'm not the only one who thinks this way. Everybody thinks this way, right? But those conspiracy theories originate and they thrive in these cultures where uh, people don't feel like they have control of their lives. And I, I use culture there because I was a biology major for a little while in, in, co- in uh, college. And I remember doing like the, the bacteria on the slides and stuff, and they call that a culture, right? So it's like the environment where the bacteria can grow. That's kind of how I view these conspiracy theories is like these bacteria, that these aren't good things, but they are thriving in these gross environments. The Petri dish <laughs> And the is gross thriving. environment. Exactly. And the gross environment just happens to be the people that we've surrounded ourselves with who are just reinforcing these negative, unhealthy uh, beliefs 
<laughs> which cause us to be bitter and resentful and bring our focus solely on ourselves and all of the things that are going wrong in our own life. And why doesn't anybody see this? Doesn't anybody care? Isn't anybody going to fix this? <laughs> That's a very helpless place to be. It is. That it is. It's it's kind of sad. I'm sitting here like processing some of what you're saying. It's like it just it's sad to watch whenever people are in that spot. But this is where yep. we get to part two. What do you do about it? And well, this is going back just real quickly. One of my action items in this section is to make a list of my own governing beliefs because mm. I think you can just let these things go. And then you can find yourself in that situation where you are identifying with the conspiracy theories. And this is not like left or right. He shares a lot of different examples of how it doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, whatever side of the political spectrum you find yourself on, you're going to find the people on your side who are going to say it's the other side's fault. Uh, I, I, again, like leaders eat last and all of that coming into play in this section for me. But it would be better for you just to attack your own governing beliefs than to have them attacked for you by yes. somebody else eventually <laughs> sad day when other people step in and take that role <laughs> yep. so again part two what do you do about it uh there's a nine nine practices that he recommends here earlier on you mentioned this is a system i didn't interpret this as a system maybe that's just mm. my viewpoint on it but that might be because you of the look term. at the action items at the end of the, the chapters. Did. Yep. Do you think that they were intended to be completed in a specific order? No. Okay. The, that that's the only thing I kind of thought they did, and that's okay. why I called it a system. Sure. I think they kind of are. I think he tries to make them build on each other, but there's a lot of like very separate concepts here, and you, I don't think you necessarily need to. Yeah, I didn't do any of those exercises because they were gonna take quite some time to work through <laughs> and i just didn't want to commit to that at this point and prop which means i'll never do anything with them uh but there's a lot that you could do there but again because of what he titles these these are practices and generally when i think of a practice it doesn't necessarily require other practices before it i mean sometimes it does it's not universal but there's so many of these that I just didn't place it as needing to be done in a certain order. Hmm. Don't know sure, what maybe. Is. I kind of felt as I read through this that he's trying to get these, specifically the principles, to be built one on top of another. Like he's layering these in specific ways. Mm -hmm. So you can't really talk about beliefs creating a shared world until you talk about beliefs being created. Sure. You know? you have to understand that pyramid before you can overlay the learning loop on top of it. And the practices are a little bit more disconnected than that. But by the time I'm getting through part one, I'm feeling like I have to do these things in a specific order. So he doesn't tell me, okay, this part's different. So I just kind of project that on part two as well. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I think at least my take on it, the principles are all standalone. The practices are all standalone but he was just a good writer and put him in a good order to where it made sense. Sure. That's the way I took That's it. That's fair. But anyway, practice one, assume you are not objective. Basically. So question, question for you. How do you pronounce this two by two grid that he has in the uh, section? Oh, pronounce it. Do you remember? I got to get there. I got to get, th there was a word, but it's I can't place it. J-O-H-A-R-I. Oh, Johari. That's it how is I pronounce Joe it. Harry. Is it? Want to know why? Be well, I know why because the two names <laughs> that are tied to it. But I pronounced yeah, it Johari in my Harry head. It. <laughs> yeah, the guys who invented this matrix, their names were Joe and Harry. Okay, so uh, Joe, J O E, Harry, H A R R Y, as you would expect. Yeah. But they call it the Joe Harry window, but they spelled it J O H A R I in the book. Yep. So yeah. <laughs> that's what we're yes. <laughs> but I taught Which in my he head I, I is Johari. <laughs> yeah, he explicitly calls that out. And when he did, I was like, oh my gosh. I, I, like you yep. that can't be why they named it that. You know, and I feel like calling it out in this chapter 
kind of discredits it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of does. Like, it's super hey, cheesy. Let's make a two by two bookworm grid and call it the Jamaica br- grid. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Totally. <laughs> I, I didn't. I don't know. Th- this book is really short. There's a lot of things that could be expounded upon. Why did he waste words explaining that? Oh, by the way, this is a combination of these two guys' first names. If people want to make that connection, go ahead and let them. <laughs> but otherwise, just let everybody call it the Jahari window, and it sounds way more official. <laughs> yep, yep. I, I kind of wanted it as a footnote. He has a lot of footnotes, but anyway, side note, I suppose. Yeah. Anyway, assume you're not objective. Uh, he had a, there's the there's at the very beginning. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's like these summaries of each chapter, and the summarization for this particular one is if you're part of the system you want to change you're part of the problem and Mm -hmm. i I like that because a lot of times i do i work at a church right a lot of times people come up to me and say hey the drums were too loud or uh, a better example is somebody came up to me this has probably been a month ago and said a certain singer sounded very tinny now Coming from the sound world, I know that if you use the word muddy or tinny or boomy or like if you use some of those terms, generally it means you have some form of an audio background because those are specific terms that we use when we're talking mm-hmm. about like an EQ on a system. They're speaking your language. It's like, okay, so I just clicked with you. It's like, okay, I didn't hear that. Here's the system. You're welcome to change it. And I got silence. And it's in a blank look because that's typically what happens is a lot of people want to complain and they want to complain about the system or whatever it is that they're seeing going wrong. But the moment you flip it and have them become part of the solution to that problem, they back out and don't want to be involved. So it's like, <laughs> if you're going to take on solving a problem or, or pointing out a problem, at least be somewhat open to at least consulting on how to solve it. But anyway, side yeah. note. Be objective. Well, this window that we mentioned at the beginning, it breaks it into four different grids. So there's things that are known to others, things that are unknown to others. That's on the Y axis. And on the X axis, there's things known by you and things that are unknown by you. And the blind spots are the things that are known to others and unknown by you. And basically, that's the place to focus. Your biggest blind spot is yourself, he says. And that gets into what you were saying. If there's a problem, assume that you are the problem. <laughs> yes, especially if, you, <laughs> if you're to part of that out, system. Yeah. Yep, and try to figure out what you are doing wrong and what you need to fix. Yep, which is so a you're great not going to change anybody else, anyways. <laughs> yeah, and and to do that, and this is where I think we were talking about things sometimes build here, but practice too is empty your cup, which. He talks about how it's difficult to learn new things or be open to new things until you let go of your old things or be willing to let go of the old things that you have you have learned. I see this a lot with folks that I do IT support for whenever they come to me and like, okay, I've got this presentation I need to make. I can't get this web link to load inside PowerPoint. And generally, whenever I get something like that, it's like my first question is, why are you loading a web page in a PowerPoint? That seems odd to me. But they have this old way that they're used to thinking about things, and I'm pitching something completely different. But in order for them to be receptive to that, they have to let go of that old thinking before they can accept that new, thus empty your cup. Yeah, I like the description here of the beginner's mind. I've heard this phrase differently before. I think it was Sean McCabe who kind of talked about the curse of knowledge. Like you forget what it was like when you were at the beginning of your, your journey, you have all this knowledge that you've accumulated over the, over time and you forget what it was like at the beginning. And in order to learn something new, you have to go back to the beginning. So good leaders, he mentions in here supplement information with sense making and walking around they're constantly emptying their cup and assuming that they know nothing about a particular situation and i think this is a place where he shared the story about the people who turn around the the companies 
Yep. Uh, they show up and they start talking to the employees and the employees share what's going wrong. And you, when I read that, I was kind of like, well, don't the managers, don't the people who are running the show, like, don't they ever talk to the employees? And, and they, in some cases they don't, but I think in other Almost cases, never. maybe they do, but they don't hear it because they have this whole, you know, however many years they've been doing things a certain way. So one person or even a group of people saying, we see this other thing that doesn't register to them because in their mind, they have built up this picture over all these, these years of this is the way that, that things are done. It's a good challenge, you know, to make this a, a practice. And again, like the, the way my brain works, assume that you are not objective, assume that your biggest blind spot is yourself. That's a prerequisite to emptying your cup. If you don't assume that you have that your biggest blind spot is yourself, you're going to go in there thinking, well, I have all of this valid information I have already collected. And essentially what he is saying in this is like, no, you got to dump it out and you got to collect new information. And then you can take it back to the lab and you can see how it jives with everything else, but everything's going to be weighted the same. Yep. So yep. I don't know, talking through this again, I do feel this is kind of uh, in a specific order, but also practice. Like this is something that you do consistently. i I don't know <laughs> these exercises. This is not something you're building into like your weekly routine. <laughs> no, <laughs> right? No, your weekly review is not going through all nine of these practices. So I, I also had a little bit of trouble like the term practice. This feels to me like, okay, do this once, and maybe that's the first time you've done it. But ultimately, after that, it's it's these are kind of like my generic action items that maybe I'll do them, maybe I won't. I won't have any way to document them. They just sort of happen in the background, maybe kind of, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> okay i want to go into the next one because it ties into this perfectly i think maybe this yeah, is why you say it builds but so empty your cup let go of the things you've learned before to be open to the new things however you cannot do that unless you have <laughs> practice number three which is create a safe space because in the case of the company you're referring to i don't i don't think he gave us the name of the company but they did one of two things if they were brought in they either guided your company through bankruptcy or they did they buy it from them they bought out they their turned debt. it around but they owned it yep they, they came in at the point where it yep. was already too far gone for you to maintain control Correct. and to save it they would pay off your debt in exchange for the company and yep. by doing that they would then kick you out as the management team and they would start the process of listening to all of the people. But in order to do that, they had to make these safe, like they had to make a safe space for people to feel comfortable to, to share their inner beliefs about how the company could be made better. Thus, practice three, create a safe space. And this is one that I think is absolutely vital. And it's part of, I think, oddly enough, even though I'm talking about how these are building on each other, this is one that I feel like stands alone because this is one that I think a lot of the others are dependent on, even the ones before mm -hmm. it. So the ones before mm -hmm. it are kind of dependent on this, including the ones after that. So this one, although it's still three in the list out of nine, I feel like it could have been much up in the top one or two, probably, just yep. because it is the other two are dependent on that, I would say. Well, this one's interesting because he mentions the SCARF model for caring for emotional needs. And Which, at this point, by the way, emotional needs. I love the acronym SCARF. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and at this point, whose emotional needs are you caring for? Not your own. So it stands for status. Does this person feel important, recognized, or needed by others? Certainty. Do they feel confident they know what's ahead? Autonomy. Do they feel like they have control of their life, work, and destiny? Relatedness. Do they feel like they belong? Fairness. Do they feel like they're be being treated fairly? So he's making a switch here, which again, I think is very much in line with a linear progression because you can't start by looking at other people first. You have to make sure your ducks are in a row. So assume you're not objective, empty your cup. I feel like those are prerequisites before you would try to apply this scarf model. Now, interestingly, the examples he uses in this chapter are really 
examples, negative examples of places that have neglected the scarf model, which have gotten those companies to the point where his friend shows up and takes them over. <laughs> yep. So it's almost like you're either doing this or you are not surviving as a business. And that I, I think is is true. But the larger point, I think, in this section, uh, the part that stood out to me anyways, is that it is impossible to leave your feelings at the door. So when you empty your cup, you're emptying it of everything except your feelings because those are going to stay. <laughs> and on page 77, he says something which I think is pretty profound as it pertains to personal productivity. We achieve results in life not because we're objective, but because we care. So it does not matter what sort of system you apply to your life the perfect system is going to do nothing for you unless you are emotionally invested in working that particular system. <laughs> and then he crosses the bridge into like, not just you, but other people. He says, reasons don't get people to act, emotions do. And when I read this, I am applying it to myself. I'm asking myself, you know, how can I apply emotion, emotional motivation basically to the things that I want to do i do see how people could take this approach and try to apply it in an organization but i think it's summarized as don't be a jerk and build trust over time <laughs> <laughs> yep that'd do it too <laughs> yeah there was the, they tell the story of the guy who had the tea in this section we got to keep moving but he had a uh an area in his little uh, office cubicle where he could make tea and whenever people would come to him who were upset or wanted to file a complaint with him he's like well let's talk about it over tea well think about the tea making process you have to heat up the water you have to let it steep and then you can begin the process of drinking it and they make the side note that it's rare that people can be upset and angry while they're drinking a cup of tea so there's that going for tea and Does that work with coffee too? No, it doesn't. Guaranteed. Mm. <laughs> I've been in coffee dates where the other person is very angry with me. <laughs> it does not work. Did you make it by hand prior to that though? Like kind of what I was thinking is like this oh, is a perfect sure. excuse sure. for you to to buy that little contraption. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, you should post a link to this ridiculous coffee maker that I found and I told Mike he needs to buy it. What is it? It takes like is it 15 hours to make a cup of coffee? I forget what it was. Maybe it was three hours. I don't remember what it was. It's the Belgium Luxury Royal Family Balance Siphon Coffee Maker in gold. And it's not nearly as expensive as I thought it was when yes. you shared the yeah. link to me. Uh, this probably doesn't take that long, to be honest. I've seen siphon coffee before. This is probably... You know, if you're making tea from scratch and you had to let it steep, this is probably something similar. Sure. Which is what got me thinking, like, maybe this serves the same sort of purpose and you should get this for your office. Sure. So you can have sure. those tough conversations. <laughs> Too funny. I did, I did find this on Amazon, so I will post this in the, the chat. <laughs> Too funny. Anyway, making tea makes a safe space and then people are able to, to talk about uh, difficult things. Which brings us to practice four triangulate and validate and this is if, if i were to summarize this look at a situation from as many viewpoints as you can and try to validate all of the steps in the process to figure out which of those is most true i guess would be the way to say that but if something doesn't make sense in the midst of trying to validate that thing you're likely missing something and sure as many examples as I've tried to come up with, the easiest one in my mind right now is COVID and vaccines. And it doesn't matter where you land on this. If you're an anti-vaxxer or you're a hardcore vaxxer, where do you want to land in this? Trying to see that viewpoint from as many different angles as you can and try to figure out the facts around it, no matter which side you're on, is actually quite difficult, I find to get something very solid no matter which side you're trying to come at it from. And I think it's because we've got so many of these, uh, what was the term earlier? The the self-confirming biases and stuff that we yeah, tend to sit on. Bubble of belief, there you go. Like Because of that, it's very hard to get yourself to break outside of that and see things from a different viewpoint. 
politics is a prime example of that. People don't want to look <laughs> beyond their party lines at all to consider something. So anyway, try to see something from a bunch of different angles. If something doesn't make sense in the process of trying to understand that viewpoint, you're probably missing something. That's the point. The best line in the whole book is in this chapter. Okay. <laughs> he says, the internet is like a grocery store of facts. I saw this. I <laughs> loved that. It's a great quote. <laughs> yeah. And the point there is that you're not going to buy everything in the grocery store. You're going to pick and choose a few specific things that you want. And when it comes to facts, you can find a few specific things that support your bubble of belief if you want to do that. Yes. So triangulation is trying to look at things from other perspectives to escape that. And this kind of ties back to the idea of falsifiability, which, again, is from the great mental models. The test of a good theory is not whether it can be proven that it's true, but whether it can be disproven. That should be our goal when we're trying to examine a theory and asking ourselves, is this, is this correct? Uh, just because you can predict someone's behavior, it says, doesn't mean that you validated it. <laughs> Which that, that applies it specifically to individuals and the way that they act. And I think that's an interesting application. There's a lot of value just in that. We judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. You know, just because you can predict someone's going to respond this way, you don't really know why they're responding that way. So it's a good reminder to try to understand people's core motivations. Put yourself in, in their shoes and, and try to look at it from their perspective. But it's also a lot broader than that. We should be doing that with every belief that we come in contact with. And the big challenge for me, I think, as I read this is just collect other viewpoints, which I know are contrary to the ones that are convenient and comfortable for me. Go read the news sources from the, the places that I know are going to disagree with my worldview. Just because my worldview is not going to be complete reality. That's back to part one. You know, I have my one perspective on this and maybe my, my uh, maybe I, I know this is kind of best case scenario, right? But let's assume that the way I'm approaching something is correct. It still doesn't mean that there's not other correct uh, interpretations of those of the the same reality just because i have one piece of the elephant and someone else is a different piece of the elephant doesn't mean that i can call their definition of the elephant incorrect but that's that's wrong i think that's the big takeaway from this is like give other people a break assume that there's some truth in everything and challenge everything that you think you know <laughs> yeah yep which that's a good lead into practice five actually ask questions make connections there's a story here, I don't know the guy's name, but he was a, a change agent, I guess would be the term for him, and he was tasked with going into an area and trying to help figure out uh, how to fix some societal issues, and what he decided to do, what he normally does, is just start walking the streets and just talking to people, just asking them, how's life? What would make it better? Do you like the government? Do you, you know... How do things go for you? And he ran across some fishermen who were telling the story of how, you know, fishing's great. We're always able to catch more than we need, and we can easily get them to the market. Problem is, you know, they start to spoil as the day goes on, and we can't sell anything at our higher prices early in the morning because no one comes and buys them until later when we have to drop the prices whenever they've been sitting out in the sun all day long. So we can't get good prices on our fish because they've been sitting out in the sun all day long. Okay, all right, well, I hope you get that figured out. And then he goes on down the road, and I forget what it was he bought, a, a drink of some sort that was cold. And yeah. it was in the same market area as these guys selling the fish. And it's like, how did you get this cold? Like, oh, with the ice that I have here. How did you get the ice? There's no electricity in this marketplace. I'm like, how did you get the ice? Oh, well, there's this guy. He makes these massive blocks of ice. So he goes and finds the guy that's making the ice blocks and talks to him, and it turns out he's got like a generator and a whole process that he can go through to make ice, and he sells it to a few of these folks. He's like, well, how would you like to massively increase your business? 
<laughs> what if you could sell a lot more ice? Could you handle that? And he figures it out, and he's like, okay. So then he connects the fishermen to the ice maker, and guess what? They're able to keep their high prices all day long, and it starts to fix some of the poverty issues with the fishermen, thus starting to create the societal change that he was tasked with solving. The point of this is asking questions just to figure out how things work and how people think, what makes them excited, what makes them upset, and then start to connect the dots between what their problems are and what other people could potentially solve for them or yourself. Like this is just a marketing thing <laughs> in that sense. But this is a very interesting thing because you can start to connect the dots between your beliefs and somebody else's beliefs, help some folks out in the process. So I love that story of recognizing that, hey, ice could be used over here too. I want to divert a little bit from the point that he's making here, though, because that story perfectly illustrates the approach that I take with my notes inside of Obsidian. So instead of asking yourself, how, how are do you other making that think? jump, dude? Like, <laughs> no, listen, listen. So you're at, you, you said this just now. You said uh, some form of he's asking the question, how do other people think? Yep. That's what I do inside of my note app, notes app is how do I think? <laughs> <laughs> I look at these connections and I'm like, where can I use these things in other places? And how do these things connect that I am I'm not seeing? So that's the personal application of this for me. But I do love the fact that he's calling this out and asking these questions. And I think in this section is the story where they, I can't remember the exact chapter, but in this, this section, he talks about the, the UNICEF and how they were going to give the laptops to people. And they, they were going to write their stories. And they didn't really understand that no one really wanted to figure out how to use these laptops and tell their stories. So uh, they were asking questions before they delivered all these laptops uh, that were based on their perspective and where they were coming from. So he mentions that when you ask these questions, you have to ask them without any of your bias attached to them. You can't go into it thinking a certain way because what you'll do is you will ask the questions in a way that will confirm the bias that you have. So go in and ask questions about things that seem obvious to other people. Yeah, dig to the bottom of things and keep asking why, but also just do it in a way where you're going to get a broad range of, of answers. Uh, I think this is one of those aha moments for me where I don't have anything specific with this, but I do want to, whenever I ask a question, ask it in a way where I am getting a true, honest, open answer. And I can totally see looking back on how I've been guilty of asking things in a specific way in order to kind of collect the data points that I want. Uh, and it's not insidious. It's not something that like you're trying to formulate a specific story. It just kind of happens. As an example, with like the product development process, you send out these surveys, right? You want to identify people's biggest problems with Obsidian or whatever before crafting solutions for them. Like we've done that with this suite setup, but I can even see places where we're coming into this with a certain perspective of this is the problem people are having. And maybe it's uh, our fish are rotting too fast and they don't see the fact that, oh yeah, there is ice on the other side of the market. We can yep. totally use it right. over here. I don't know how to break down those walls other than to just try to make those as many weird connections as you can. And some of them are going to provide those inspirations and, and stick. Yes. hundred percent. Let's go on to practice six disrupt routines. This is another way that you can, you know, start to challenge your own beliefs or challenge how things can be done but essentially it's just what it sounds like many beliefs are like cemented into our day-to-day -day routines or even our week-to-week -week routines and they just become on autopilot to use the term that he uses in the summary here uh, but if a routine is a problem disrupt the routine to create new possibilities that's from him one of the stories in here was that there was a, I think it was a mom, and she had a son, teenage son, that was playing games too late at night, and she could never get him to put the games <laughs> away and yeah. go to bed. And she would 
normally go in, get upset, tell them to shut the game off and go to bed. And that was the normal routine. And it sometimes worked, didn't work always, but created this kind of negative culture. Well, one night she decided to, instead of going in and throwing her hissy fit, uh, she went downstairs and turned off the wireless router instead of genius doing her normal and he of course is like wait what's going on there's no wi-fi what does everybody do when there's no wi-fi you go to the router and you reset it right this is what everybody does everybody knows you go unplug it wait 30 seconds plug it back in or the impatient ones of us unplug it count to three and plug it back in and (laughs) this is what he went down to do and found his mom standing there with the cord (laughs) to the router in her hand (laughs) it's like oh Okay, I'll go to bed now. <laughs> and then he goes to bed. <laughs> I have no idea how that story turns out long term, but it's that's the concept, right? Disrupt the routines, change the way you're coming at things, uh, to to change up uh, the potential behind how you believe things or what you believe, I guess. That was actually the author's wife, by the way. Oh, it was. I missed that. Yeah. Or at least I didn't remember that. <laughs> he shared this manuscript before it published, and she started thinking this way and then that was her solution to that problem That's what it was yeah which got me thinking you know there are certain things that are shall we say a little bit more difficult than they should be like getting people to bed on time so (laughs) i i want to take this approach of figuring out you know what are the routines and what are the ways that we can disrupt them i don't think this is as simple as unplugging a a wi-fi no not generally (laughs) Uh, that's a pretty genius uh, application of that, by the way, though, because it's kind of happening until they intervene, and then the way they intervene wasn't producing the result that they wanted to. With something like bedtime, I don't think it's as simple because it's not a process that happens without any involvement. So we're an active part of that, so maybe we can change you know, some of the ways that we do it. But I think the real place to apply this is those kind of automatic cycles that you're not driving anyways and then figuring out what you can do to step in at a specific point and change the the trajectory i don't have any other specific examples of that but i loved that story and i think if i spend some time thinking about it there's probably a bunch of places that i could apply that in my own life so practice seven is act as if in the here and now as if in the here and now uh, this is basically like if you have a belief that you're not 100% sold on and you don't know if it's one of these governing beliefs for you, you could change it or act as if it's true right now to find out and see how things turn out. Uh, I, yep. An example from college for me is our uh, – oh, shoot, what was his name? I can't think of his name. Anyway – his job was to help students pick majors, essentially. That was his consultant-type position with students. And anytime he had a student come in and say, I don't know if I want to be an engineer. I've been considering nursing or being a teacher or going into farming. Or he was like, I don't know if that's what I want to do. He would have them change their major immediately, like right then. Like, you think you want to do that? Great. Let's change your major right now. What? So they would change his, their major and then go through the process of redetermining all the classes that would be necessary to make that happen. Now, they are, of course, in the middle of classes right then. So they have to finish out that semester and then they would figure out how to make it work for the remainder, however many semesters they had left. But that's what he did. Every time, if someone was questioning their major, he would have them change it immediately. Interesting. And I know a lot of people who were very grateful for that because what it did was it forced people to then start thinking like they are a different, like on a different trajectory overnight. And they have the path to get there already laid out for them. So then they're essentially acting as if they are that major because they are technically. And then they can figure out Mm -hmm. if that's the right path or not. And if they realize, nope, I was on the right path to begin with, well, guess what? You already had that path laid out. Let's just revert back and go back to that one. But it generally only took about a week for the people to figure out if the major actually needed to change or not. So that's all it took. I always thought that was genius. Interesting. 
that's an interesting example of this uh, this principle. Uh, he goes back to the learning loop here. He's got a double loop learning, which I'll just quickly go through the steps here. But I think this totally applies to what you just shared, where number one, you recognize you're operating from a bubble of belief, which is a reality distortion field. Number two, you don't just observe behavior. You try to figure out the underlying needs and beliefs that are operating. Number three, if you're seeing the results that you want, great. But number four, if not, explore and examine as many alternate beliefs as you can with that guidance counselor type person. Yeah, it's probably a good name <laughs> was for Was doing was forcing people to actually think through the rest of the process and explore those alternate beliefs and then go ahead and try it. See what happens. Did it improve the situation? If so, great. If not, you can always go back to the old way or Dave Gray would say, you know, repeat as necessary, try something else. That's where, like, I think there's a limit maybe on the number of majors you want to try. So yeah. the analogy falls down. Right, right. <laughs> but there are these worlds of possibility that are around us. And uh, we do have to kind of engage with some of the things that we didn't really think were were possible, which is interesting because he also says in this chapter that you don't have to believe a hypothesis in order to test it. So you don't have to assume that this is true or even feasible. You could just see, yeah, let's just see if this works. And maybe it does. Yep. Maybe you end up becoming a productivity writer, podcaster, whatever, when you spent your entire <laughs> life working for the family business. You know, oh, let's just see what happens. Yeah, let's give it a <laughs> shot. Who knows? Who knows? All right, that brings us to practice eight which is make sense with stories. This one I feel like is super simple. Like if you're trying to relay a belief to someone else, guess what? The best way to do that is to tell a story. This is why, yep. and he even calls this out, every single principle, every single practice that he brings up, every chapter begins with a story. This is also why Mike and I do this a lot, where when these chapters come up, there's a point that comes up, what happens? We tell a story about it because then it allows me to relay that concept, that belief, to use this terminology, within the existing beliefs that I have so that the point gets across the way I want it to get across. So telling stories yep. is the way to do that, which, again, I think this is something we know is fairly straightforward. Yeah, though the reason why I think is kind of interesting, and we've heard this other places, I don't remember specifically, but the whole idea of the neural coupling where when someone is telling you a story that your brains connect and you tend to mirror each other, he gets a little bit more specific and he talks about how when you're going through the the conflict, your brain's producing one chemical, and then when there's a resolution, there's another chemical. I don't know if that understanding all that process really changes anything yeah. for me, <laughs> but it was interesting. Yeah, I hear you. All right, the last practice here is practice nine, evolve yourself. and The whole book in a nutshell. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say this is just a, be willing to change your beliefs. That That's pretty much what it says. <laughs> Let's yep. summarize the whole book up with be willing to change, which is what he's been trying to convince us of this entire time. There is one thing in this section, which I think I've been guilty of overlooking this, uh, is that risks come in all shapes and sizes. He does reiterate that you won't change the world without changing yourself. So that's the place to start. You're focusing on yourself. He already said that. But he also says that risk is always there whether you realize it or not. So when you think about that, that kind of changes your approach to maybe some life-changing decisions because you can kind of find yourself in a position where, well, I've got, these responsibilities, I'm married, I have kids, whatever, and I've always wanted to go out and do my own thing, but I have this comfortable job and it's providing for us. And so there's more risk in stepping out there and doing my own thing. But that's the natural part of the thought process. And we never counterbalance that by realizing that there is actually risk with just leaving things the way that they are. Yep. And in that particular example, I don't think my blanket advice would be like, well, there's risk no matter what you do. So just step out there and see if you can make it happen. 
But I use that as an example because you and I, I think, have both been in that position and probably a lot of the people who are listening to this. And we can apply that a lot of other places where just because we've done something one way before doesn't automatically mean that that's the safe alternative. There's risk no matter what we do. So number one, we don't really have to be afraid of it. And number two, if we do fail, it's not going to be as catastrophic probably as we make it out to be in our own heads. We tend to be very uh, apprehensive of change and, and uncertainty. But I think he's trying to encourage us at this point in the book that everything's uncertain. Everything you thought you knew is wrong anyways. So just challenge some things. Maybe you'll get that position that requires a master's without the master's. All right. Ready for action items? You got more you want to say? That's it. Okay. Let's do it. All right. I have one action item, which is a little odd in this scenario because this is one of those books where it's like you need to think this way. Like it's, I feel like it's difficult to get a physical action out of this, like a tactical, practical thing to do from a book that's designed to help you think about your beliefs differently. And as I was pondering that, walking the trails at our new property last night and just kind of wondering my way around this book and the topics around it, it occurred to me, it's like, actually, the thing I need to do with this particular book is take, he has this, at the beginning, and I'll talk about this here in a second with style and rating, but he has this executive summary up at the very front of this, which I love because it's made it very easy for me to reference different things throughout this book. And I want to take that and print it up on a eight and a half by 11, laminate it, stick it to the wall in front of my computer. And it's primarily because there's a lot of this that's hard to like keep in your head like it's hard to keep that in in mind. So I just want to have something around that I'm probably not going to look at it every day. I'm probably not going to like after a couple of weeks it'll probably be something I don't reference very often. But having it there to bring it up in mind occasionally I think would be super helpful. So that's the one thing Let's I want to do, do with this one. Cool. I may look into that too. I'm sure there's like a larger poster style version oh, sure. of this. Oh, sure. Yeah, I hadn't looked, thought of that, but really yeah. cool, you know. That's a good idea, too. Uh, I've got two, both from part one, which is identify my limiting beliefs that I have unwillingly just taken on from other people in my life and then make a list of my governing beliefs so I can challenge them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's interesting that you said that, uh, and I agree with you, that there isn't any real direct sort of action items with this because he tries to give you one every single chapter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, again, you know, that part didn't really stick with me. So I guess that's getting into style and rating, but. Okay. All right, let's step into that then. Uh, I suppose I have to go first. So the style on this, I think he nailed it. Like, it's a two-part book. We didn't even notice. Like We didn't mention that. It's not a three-parter. We got an introduction and two parts. So there's that. Uh, I think he set that up really well, Like as far as like laying out the principles and then laying out the practices about what to do about it. Like it's the, it's the classic, here is the problem or the inspiration, if you will, and then here's what you do with it. Now, I say that knowing that I just said this isn't a book that has explicit action items with it, even though he has exercises here. Uh, but I just didn't take any of those to heart. But in this particular case, like I think he does do this really well. He does not belabor any topic. It's 144 pages long, lots of diagrams. The first page of each chapter, I notice, has a little bit larger font than the rest of them within the chapter. There's like a summary page that's mostly white, and there's a lot of blank space in this. I'm just saying that. And yet it feels very dense. I feel like we covered a ton. Like this is a long episode for a short book, if you get what I'm saying. So it's very dense. It's very compact. And as a result, like I feel like I learned a ton going through this, and it made me wish a lot of people had read this. 
especially given how hot topic things are today and how firmly people latch on to beliefs that are unfounded in many cases. And that's something that I wish more people would are willing to challenge, myself included. Like, I have beliefs that I, you know, just said, foundational things that people don't get. Like, well, maybe I'm the one that's the problem there. So these are things that I think would be extremely helpful. Uh, he did, he does have this at the very beginning. There's the outline. Where's it at? I just lost it. Mm -hmm. um, but he has a contents and executive summary. We don't normally see this in a book. I can only think of one other book where we've had this, and that was How to Read a Book. But apparently, knowing, having gone through How to Read a Book, this used to be the norm where people would have chapter titles and then an explanation of what was going on in that chapter before you read the book. And people would read the table of contents to decide if they wanted to read the book or not. This is like an homage back to that time because this is how it's set up. They ha he has the two parts. He has like a one or two sentence explanation of what's going on in each chapter. That's the stuff that I'm wanting to take and put on the card or find a poster of in some form. I really, really like this. I wish more people did this. Not just because it makes it easy to do bookworm, but just because it makes it very easy to reference what's in the book ahead of time. Some people probably read that and shortcut it and don't actually read the whole book, but, you know, at least they got something out of it that way. But I really, really <laughs> like that. As far as how to rate it, I don't know that I have anything I don't like about it. I mean, it's something that I wish a lot of people would read. I think there's a ton of very valuable information and insight here. Again, I mentioned earlier that I was trying to read this from the lens of could you read this without having read a bunch of others? I think you totally can. I don't think you have to have some of these background books that we have to get a lot of value out of this. I'm very grateful for having read this one. I am going to put this at a 5.0. I am. Just because I think this is one that I'm going to reference for quite some time. I can already tell that. Just because it's like starting to, like this conforms with a lot of how I'm starting to like think about things. Maybe that's why I like it, but I do really appreciate his willingness to even challenge himself as he goes through it. So yeah, I'm going to put it at a five. I think it's way up there. I think people should read this. Definitely. Cool. Well, I agree. This is a great book. It is a very easy read, to be honest. I mean, you could take a lot of time and really think through the concepts that he is telling you. If you digest it as you go, I think maybe it takes you quite a while to get through those 144 pages. But it's a very engaging read, and nothing feels like a mental burden, like you have to just pause and unravel stuff in order to figure it out. Uh, I had that sort of thought when I read C.S. Lewis in college. I had a class, actually, that part of the required reading was The Problem of Pain. And C.S. Lewis was that way, where you could read a single page, and then you had to stop for a couple of hours and think about what he just said in that one single page because there was so much there. So this is like some really heady topics that you could take that approach with, but he doesn't write it in a way where it feels like you have to do that. Uh, it's also very visual, and I feel like the visuals that he shares are very, very good. I've got some snapshots of some of the diagrams and things inside of the, the MindNode file that I, I took for this one. Uh, I would recommend this for just about anybody. I don't think it's quite as good as the Great Mental Models. I still am a little bit confused by these action items at the end of every chapter. I don't think they were necessary, and I feel that... Every single time I got to one and I had to make the choice, no, I'm not going to do that right now, I felt a little bit guilty, like I wasn't doing what he had asked me to do. And so am I really getting the results from this book that he expects me to get? Maybe I didn't. I think that's very uh, that's a definite possibility that like this book just didn't knock my socks off because I didn't follow through and do every little thing that he did or that he recommends that you do. But I also think a lot of the concepts and things that he mentions in here Again, very effective writing style, but having read some other books like The Great Mental Models, I now know there are people who explain them better. Yeah. <laughs> like the map is not the territory just as one example. And maybe that's the only example. I don't know. But 
it's a it's a really good book and i would definitely recommend people read it if i could recommend a set of books i think i probably would i would include this one and the great mental models uh, i feel like if you read both of those you've got a better understanding of some of the things that he's talking about in this one but i also having talked through this with you i do think this stands alone on its own just maybe doesn't have quite the impact that it had for me so great book not quite as good as some of the other ones i would define as in this genre and what is this genre i don't even know i don't know it's it's not even it's not like critical thinking it is sort of like the mental models is the best term that i can think of for this he gives you some different ways to think about things but then kind of leaves it up to you in order to apply these in your own life which i like that is very much my i that that's my wheelhouse that's my jam i love that kind of stuff so anytime you want to pick a book that fits into that category i will probably rate it very highly um but i am going to hold it up against the great mental models as the the gold standard of the 5.0 so for that reason alone i think it's 4.5 <laughs> sure um, sure i don't know if that's that's fair to the book you know but uh yeah that's that's what i'm that's what i'm going to do it's a it's a great primer for these sorts of things. However, if you want to really dive uh, dive deep on this sort of stuff, I would recommend that you at least pick up the Great Mental Models Volume One. Also, yeah, I I tend to call these like mental constructs books. Like, how do you think? Mm -hmm. Type of thing. Anyway, we can put it on the shelf. What's next, Mike? Next is Willpower Doesn't Work by Benjamin Hardy, uh, because it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> all right no lots of stuff lots of stuff kind of contributing to this uh i came across something that i shared with you about procrastination and adhd and i'm like is this true and you're like absolutely and then we've also read procrastinate on purpose we've read way back in the day the willpower instinct and kind of a lot of things coming together in my world right now which are challenging this whole belief of willpower as a way to get things done and uh this book by its title you know is attacking that very belief and i'm 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 curious you know i want to see <laughs> yeah i want to see what what they're going to propose here uh it's kind of interesting coming off the heels of this book because for a long time that was like the bubble of belief is like oh you just got to protect your mental resources protect your willpower and so now i'm i'm kind of applying this right i'm challenging that and like well what's sure. the what's the alternative here <laughs> <laughs> fun i'm looking forward to this one this will be good following that we're gonna go through the mountain is you by brianna west w-e-i-e-s-t west west i'll have to figure out how to say that i say that and then i probably won't anyway subtitle on this is transforming self-sabotage into self-mastery so if you sabotage yourself so that you fail. That's what we're going to talk about. I do this. All right. Do you do this? I do this. I definitely I think do everybody this. does this. It's, I think we all do. <laughs> so anyway, if you're a self-sabotager, we're going to talk about it. But that's in four weeks, not two. Anyway, right. there you go. Got any gap books, Mike? I do not. How about you? Not even close. I'm remodeling a house. There's no time. I barely got through this one, and it was short. So here we go. <laughs> right. Great fun. So, yes, if you have no gap books, I have no gap books. Huge thank you to those of you who have tuned in today uh, to watch us live. Hi. And who are now listening in your car and such. Thank you for joining us uh, as we go through this. If you haven't already, go to our Bookworm Club, club.bookworm.fm. Go to bookworm.fm slash membership or club.bookworm.fm slash membership. Either one works. And go ahead and sign up there. It's five bucks a month. You get access to a premium area inside the, the club there, but you get access to Mike's mind node files that he puts together for the show. You get to be an awesome person because you help the show stay on. And we just love you. So thank you for those of you who have joined the Bookworm Club membership. And if you haven't, you need to do that bookworm.fm slash membership. All right. If you are reading along, pick up Willpower Doesn't Work by Benjamin Hardy, and we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks.
and save. Good job, sir. You as well. That was a fun one. Long one. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. Cool, cool. Oh. I'm not going to get a nap today. <laughs> As if I normally would. Can't just go sleep in your car anymore? Mm -mm. <laughs> oh, Blake, to answer your question, because I didn't in the episode, if you're still here, uh, whenever people would change their major, it was about a third of them would change it back. I remember he had said that, that a lot of people would change it back because they realized they were correct to begin with. <laughs> but they didn't know that until they tried switching. Right. Interesting. Kind of a fascinating thing. Here, if you don't like what your trajectory is for the rest of your life, here, let's change it. Yeah. In 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Fun, fun. Should we schedule the next one? Let's do it. Okay. What are we on? The 30th? Works for me. It does not work for me. <gasps> I know, right? That's a first, isn't it? No, it's not a first. <laughs> um, I'm off that whole week. So... So, 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 you want to so, do it so. Monday the second? I think I'll have to. Yeah, because I'm gonna be booked solid from Monday morning through the next Saturday night. It looks like because I'm taking okay. off work and I'm gonna be neck deep in taking walls out and stuff. Great fun, right? All right, Monday the second works What's for me. What time? Two o'clock. Sure. Okay. 2 p.m. Central. You heard it here, folks. Yes, yes, yes. We don't do it in Zencaster anymore. Do <laughs> it's true. Go, 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 go. There it goes. Cool. Awesome. Good job, team. If you haven't already, hit the like button, subscribe, hit the bell, all the things. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny. Super cheesy. I'm not doing that every time. It's just, I feel like I'm supposed to do that. <laughs> is what it is. Nah, just throw stuff out there and people will subscribe, kind of. Subscribe, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of. Okay. Anything else you want to tell the world before we go? Nah. Thanks, everybody. Fun chat today. Certainly. All right. We'll see you in two weeks and three days. Two weeks and two days. Something like that. Yep. Cool, cool. Extra time to get it done. All right. Bye, all. Extra time to procrastinate. <laughs> <laughs>